what's up y'all so I'm getting ready to run in the gym but before I go in there I just had a couple of thoughts on my mind that I wanted to share with you before I forgot so if someone doesn't want to work with me I don't want to work with them if someone doesn't want to hire me I don't want to work for that company if someone doesn't want me going to their learning institution to their school I don't want to go there nor do I want to send my children there and with that mindset I've been able to navigate my own life in a way that uh, creates my own independent income wealth and in a manner that makes me less dependent upon the quote-unquote system and the status quo that defaults to other people in positions of authority over me and I think as a community if black people focus more upon institution building that we would have less of a primary focus upon the doors that were not let in that we are not let in and the tables that we're not allowed to sit at now the reason why I'm talking about this is because um, I've been watching the reaction to the recent Supreme Court decision on affirmative action and it is one of outrage as it should be However, I think that we need to make a few things clear. And one of those things is that many of these groups that are out here expressing their outrage at that Supreme Court decision, they're not angry about the detrimental effects that it's going to have on the African American community. A lot of these groups, they're pissed off because of the loss of additional privileges that they received under affirmative action, usually to the detriment of black people, especially black men. Now, do I believe that affirmative action is necessary? Yes, but not in the way that it was implemented or the way that it has existed for over 60 plus years in this country, where it has elevated other groups, primarily white women, over black people in, an, a, in a way that diluted the black struggle and while simultaneously presenting affirmative action as something that was for the protection of black people when also in fact I'm now now I would say has affirmative action helped black people in any way yes I think affirmative action has actually largely helped a lot of black women to achieve wealth in many cases independent wealth that is independent of black men which is also part of the problem because I believe that affirmative action has been largely beneficial for economics for black women, but not actual institutional power, no power. And that's very easy to conflate the two when you're making money, but you're not building anything, especially when you're not building it with your counterparts, which is black men. So while black women have been accomplishing a lot of things under affirmative action, black men have pretty much wholly been ignored and whenever you yield a there's a net negative result from any policy which obviously falls on black men not benefiting from affirmative actually black men have benefited the least from affirmative action while white women benefited the most this is the truth so I understand the outrage at the concept at, at, at the concept of affirmative action being struck down but the concept of it isn't the problem it was the implementation of it that was the problem and it was implemented by those who do not have any direct interest in that policy it was implemented and carried out by those who are foreign to the struggle of true marginalized groups so how can I ask someone who has never been in my shoes to create some form of a policy or standard for my protection so what I'm basically trying to say is this black people have been consistently under attack in the United States since the Emancipation Proclamation when we were supposedly set free but I mean we've been under attack uh, from the criminal justice system, economically, politically, socially. And with that knowledge, I think we must be more uh, capable of navigating this society, our politics, 
and our alliances in a manner that is more intelligent and able to identify disingenuous allies because we have a hell of a lot of them. So is affirmative action needed? Yes, as a concept, as a concept, something that truly does enforce equality and diversity and equity, especially in a system that has been so uh, disproportionately biased against black people. But black people, what we had ain't it. That's just the truth. Now we know why they struck it down. We know why most people strike, strike these sorts of policies down. Because in their ignorant minds, a lot of them are attacking black people. But I think what we do as black people is we don't realize how many of the allies that we have, they're not truly fighting for us. They're, trying, they're, they're fighting for the benefits that they receive at our expense. And so if and when any sort of policy is actually created that truly benefits marginalized groups, I just want black people in, in particular to, or whoever crafts such legislation, crafts it in a way that makes it much easier to identify people who present their, themselves as allies who are truly your enemy. We need to get better at identifying the people who are really on our side or the people who are just there in a moment of convenience. Peace. Socialization, rite of passage programs, mental health programs, domestic violence programs, uh, advocacy in the courtroom program, advocacy in the school system programs. I have gone to battle uh, with uh, parts of the judicial system, actually having made some connections and friends along the way, but a lot of enemies. Uh, same thing with school systems across the USA uh, in the uh, policies and the way that it impact our black children. Uh, some of which I'm going to actually talk to you about. We need your support. This isn't a fly-by-night organization. We've been going strong as an organization for um, 20, 20 years, and I've been doing this for 35. So we need your support. If you believe in the work I'm doing, if you believe that what I do here, consistency, is something you stand on, we need your help. With that being said, look in the description box, show some love and give. We have had a week and I can't possibly touch it all here because I'm trying to actually unwind as I get to this space, but that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to unwind. So I'm, I'm gonna be careful how I approach this because it needs for me to get wound up. Um, the Supreme Court, let's do that. Supreme Court in one day rules that uh, business owners have the right to refuse to offer service um, that conflict with their religious beliefs. Uh, specifically, they're ruling on something that had already been ruled on quite a while ago based on something that happened in Arizona, I want to say 2005, 2006. If I'm not mistaken, I could be off a year. But 
basically in Arizona, uh, a gay couple came to a bakery to bake them a cake for their, or it was a portrait or something like that. It was something and the person refusing was sued and actually lost. So they're ruling on it now and they've actually reversed it. So the, the, the first time around, the LGBT community won. Uh, second time around, Christian faith and principles, moral values on that. So basically based on a person's faith and belief, they can refuse to offer service to someone who violates that belief. Um, now, to me, this should have been a no-brainer simply based on the separation of church and state. But the problem is there hasn't been a distinct and clean separation of church and state. And when you blur that line and when you start crossing in and when you start commingling, it makes it easy to say, well, you're involved, you're doing this, well, you can say this. There should never have been a situation where the government can tell the church what it can do or its members what it can do outside of the confines of what is obviously legal. You can't kill, you can't steal, all those different things. But as far as ex exercising your faith and especially tenets within your faith that have been going on, this isn't a jab at the LGBTQ community. This is saying in the same right you want your rights defended, you've got to respect the rights of others, meaning you don't get to push your agenda down the throats of people. People simply can't stop you from living your life. It doesn't mean every space is offered to you. That's why I've never been a fan of the big fight by blacks for integration. Why? Because you're demanding to fit into a space that wasn't created for you and your thing is saying, I don't care if it makes you uncomfortable, I wanna be here. And guess what? Nobody's comfortable now. Because if you're making them uncomfortable in their space, you think they're going out of their way to make you comfortable. So you've literally fought to be in a space that you're not even comfortable in, just so you can say you can be in the space. And it doesn't work. What you do is you create your own spaces. Everybody should have the right to have their own space. I want my own space. So I want to be able to sit up and say, I've got this space and it's for. And not be criticized, not be sued, not be done this way. And I want to sit up and say, you've got the right to do the same thing. I'm not offended by the fact that you've got a place over there for white people. I am not. I'm not offended that you got to put the reason you get offended when someone doesn't let you in. You think what they have is better than what you have. And when you do that, you lose the capacity, the will and the force and the fortitude to go out and make your place. It's just as good, just as nice, just as strong, just as beautiful, just as enjoyable as theirs. And the thing is, when you're looking at someone else and you're seeing them as being better, sometimes you miss the beauty in your own thing. And what happens is you've actually got something better. They've been emulating us forever. They've been culture uh, vulturing forever. They've been snatching and re uh, purposing black genius forever and we're study trying to be what they are and they are dying to be who we are and we're missing it we need to revel in who we are and so that leads me uh, to the second thing which is the second day they come right back and body slam in the eyes of most blacks body slam blacks uh, with the knocking down of affirmative action. Uh, and what I find interesting here is in knocking down affirmative action, which means that schools, and there were specifically two schools, I wanna say Harvard and another school, specifically named, but uh, that these schools which are considered uh, Ivy League schools and um, creme de la creme schools, whatever you wanna call it, um, that they could not use race or ethnicity as a means of selection in admissions or denials. And so affirmative action was put in place, same reason as the Rooney Rule in the NFL, which says that if a coaching position or upper level position comes available with a team, the team has to at least interview people of color because of the disproportionality of people of color, specifically blacks, in the NFL, despite the NFL 
Trump's talent being 75% black. So they said that that disproportionality wasn't a representation of what literally the league's commodity is, uh, but it reflects the white racial caste system that the league operates under and its ownership has been used. You, you gotta understand the average NFL owner, I think it's seven, the average age of NFL owner is 70 years old. Uh, that's slowly changing as the old heads die out. Uh, but you've got a lot of old thinking in there and these systems have been in place and these cultures have been in place forever. So that's it. So basically the Affirmative Action Act is saying they're on equal footing. This isn't go pick a dumb black kid and deny the smart white kid type thing. This is saying a certain percentage of people on equal footing that will not, under normal circumstances, even have a chance to attend your uh, institution should be allowed to. Now, having known people who have attended Ivy League schools, including Harvard, Brown, uh, Yale, Stanford, um, Princeton, um, especially a lot from Harvard. Uh, here's what I can tell you. Almost to a person, outside maybe athletes, but the average a academia, uh, a scholar, that's there solely based on their intellectual ability, um, they... Uh, to a, almost to a person say that they get there and they feel out of place especially the, at least their first year they are constantly literally in their face told they don't belong there told that the only reason they're there is because of affirmative action despite their grades and here's the thing those that don't wash out because of the pressure because of the pushback generally outshine and outperform their white counterparts who are there. Um, and so it's interesting that that's happening. Here's the thing though. At the same time they strike down affirmative action, they don't strike down the legacy uh, uh, the legacy thing where basically you can attend a university solely based on the fact that your parent or your grandparent or someone that is a close relative attended. And so basically, this is why you have, uh, number one, the cost of these, uh, uh, these the cost of these uh, schools to attend these schools are astronomical. So you have to have money, but you've got uh, people who are attending these schools whose names are literally on the buildings of some of these schools. That's how whether their parents are, that's how much of a contribution to the endowment fund that their parents have contributed. And so that legacy says, I get to go. And a lot of these kids are not academically performing at high levels. They simply are there because of the family's uh, financial legacy, the fact that they have a wealth legacy. And so that was left intact. So basically you can buy your kid into these higher institutions and now a lot of my brothers and sisters are upset and frustrated. Here's what I see. We are brilliant within ourselves. We have institutions. We have uh, historically black universities, but I think we can create even greater institutions of higher learning, greater institutions of unique capacity learning. In other words, institution that's structured around learning and developing the gifts of individuals versus teaching universal structured uh, ideologies where everybody's learning the same thing to go out and do the same thing. I think that we flourish in our gift. I think we flourish in the things that we're built to be and we're naturally passionate about. And I think that's where our greatest value to ourselves and to the world is. And I think we have the capacity to build that. I think we have the capacity to totally take control and take over. Maybe this will put some, some more of the honest back on um, the home and the family to educate our children and stop trusting a broken system to educate our children into dumbness, educate our children into docility, educate our children into uh, not being anywhere close to what they're capable of being to be 
uh, compliant and complacent. And maybe we'll start looking at ways to develop our youth into being uh, literally phenomenal and extraordinary uh, contributors to society. Um, we consistently beg them to let us in the places when we have the capacity to create our own. Do I think that, that there's a problem? Yes. Do I, do I understand what's going on? This is simply another form of genocide. This is a way to instead and ensure the wealth gap. Why? Because we know the, the, the institution, the way that the system is set up, there's more gravity and, 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 and uh, praise given to those who graduate from these types of institutions. More job offers, uh, higher salaries. All these things come from those schools. So when you sit up and say, we're no longer going to let you in, uh, despite the fact that you are intellectually qualified, academically qualified, we're not going to let you in uh, based on a system that was created to sort of level the playing field. So we are now more free to deny you or not even acknowledge you and, you know, and it, it, it that was certain certain uh, departments within these schools that would literally recruit, go out and find especially gifted black children that, you know, are not even on the radar and find them in, and invite them to apply to Harvard, to Yale, to Princeton, to Dartmouth, to Brown, all these um, Ivy League schools, Stanford, all these Ivy League schools, and then you know, enrich the program and they benefited from it. I'm, I'm hoping that for those who want to take that route, I'm hoping that those avenues still stay open despite the ruling of the court. But what you got to understand that uh, while the court is supposed to be just and ruling directly on the constitutional right, you got to understand anytime that you have one side being highly conservative and as of right now we have a conservative court. I'm not against conservatism. I'm not against liberalism. I'm against wrong and I'm against and I'm for right. And at both times they play bias and they play partisan. And so we have a responsibility to ourselves to look out for ourselves. So my hope is that we start looking for ways to be better. We start looking for ways to uh, counter their movements, but they are definitely acting so that they can uh, protect the wealth. This is what racism is designed to do. Racism is the gatekeeper of elitism. Elitism is the bigger monster, and most people aren't aware of that. We focus so heavily on racism, we don't realize it has a purpose. It's there to protect the wealthy, the ultra-wealthy. And the ultra-wealthy are guarding their wealth because what? And here's the thing that I want my black brothers to see, and that black brothers and sisters to see, and then I'm going to get off, that if they didn't fear you, they wouldn't spend so much energy and effort keeping you at bay. So instead of focusing on why you're not accepted, why you're being rejected, start focusing on why they fear you. Start focusing on what you can do for yourselves, what we can do as a unit. We've got to get out of the individualism. We've got to get out of the dissension, the internal dissension. We've got to start working together, supporting one another, building together, creating strategies, rising to uh, higher levels. When we do this, there's absolutely nothing that we cannot accomplish. So let know that we get out of here. Uh, and I just want to really and truly uh, encourage you to really take some time to think about this. And I'm, I'm going to do some more evaluating over the next couple of days and look at the total fallout of it, what it means, what it doesn't mean. And I'm going to come back with a more comprehensive, probably around an hour long, maybe I'll get Dr. Uh, excuse me, maybe I'll get Tony Lindsay. I don't know if Dr. Blanche is available, but maybe I'll get Tony Lindsay uh, to come aboard and we can talk about this uh i know that matter of fact never mind uh tiffany banks and i are going to do it monday she asked me so we're going to do that monday we're going to come back and we're going to talk about it in more in depth manner. so on that note look i'm going to get ready to get out of here you guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day don't forget to donate and show some love click that button and give on that note i'm out of here thank you
Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping here. Hope that everybody is doing okay. Uh, look, I'm not gonna be long. I'm here to talk to you uh, straightforward. Look, the easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do is to take action, to do something to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time, and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And, uh, an, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also, as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do, we consistently do, and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via cash app, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, cash app account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement we are trying to make a difference but we do need support this is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway and it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst, it's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free, I'm free.